Thank you very much, Jordi, for this uh, very practical, again, second uh, interesting presentation about systems that are really implemented in reality. And um, the distribution system sounds for me common. So I think there will be a very interesting discussion in the break with you, with also practitioners from Egypt. Um, the next speaker is um, Professor Sham Laskari. Professor Laskari is, uh, in addition to being a very good friend of mine, um, he is a professor and the director of computational and data science graduate programs um, in the, at the University of um, uh, Yeah. I missed the name of the university right now, but they're coming now. So Professor Laskari, he is an earth scientist with a major interest in natural hazards, atmospheric events. He has applications in many fields. Uh, one of the very interesting fields is uh, uh, monitoring storm and also detection using different remote sensing technologies. He works also on studying air pollution problems. He is also studying the sea level rise and also studying the impacts of severe dust storms. Um, Dr. Askari also studied and has some very interesting applications and also publications in the transport of microbes causing uh, different uh, uh, problems in different areas of the world, including Egypt as well. I have seen also a very interesting paper for him with His Excellency Professor Khaled Abdel Ghaffar, who was a very interesting paper. Um, he also didn't leave anything for us. He is recently started his application in the water resources, and I also reading with very high interest his uh, previous papers about the climate change in the Nile Basin and uh, other ones, and also change of the precipitation over the Nile. So, um, yeah, now the name of the university is Chapman University. I'm sorry for that. Uh, so uh, he got many awards, among them the professorship award from his university. He also is um, coordinator of a big European-funded project. Out of this project, he developed the Solar Atlas for Egypt, and this is also a very interesting application that is implemented by the government of Egypt for uh, uh, supporting investors in the area of solar energy. I think um, I have been talking a lot and I think I can continue introducing Dr. Hisham for uh, hours and hours based on the many publications he already published, peer-reviewed publications, conference, book chapters, etc. But now I save the time and give him the floor to tell us about his recent publication related to the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Professor Hisham, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's an honor and pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Swaylan, for the kind introduction. Um, I'd like to extend my appreciation for His Excellency uh, uh, Mr. Abdelati for the kind invitation to be part of the Cairo Water Week. And of course, uh, I would like also to, to, sh to show my appreciation uh, for His Excellency Dr. Khaled Abdel Ghaffar for his presence today. Uh, it's quite an honor and pleasure uh, to have you, sir. Um, we are talking about innovation in hydro sciences, and today I would like to take the opportunity to show the innovation that we can um, make use of in terms of Earth observations when we are trying to address uh, water-related uh, uh, issues. Uh, and today we are going to be talking mainly about radar technology and how we can use that toward one of the different or many kinds of applications, which is uh, water resources. Uh, and we are going to just showcase one of the applications uh, that we are going to be applying uh, along the Jir Dam uh, using what we call the DNSAR technology. And I'm going to be like going not in much depth just to explain what we mean by uh, those technologies uh, and we see the impact. Uh, before I get started, I would like to acknowledge all the team members uh, that have been uh, contributing to this work, um, uh, which have been like, you know, quite an interesting journey for all of us uh, to get this work uh, to be published uh, and to be acknowledged uh, in the scientific community. I would like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Amr Fawzi, who is 
um, um, a clear representation of the quality of the Egyptian scientists. Um, Mr. Joyce Thomas is one of my PhD students at Chapman University. Uh, Dr. Wunzawli is one of my most recent graduate PhD students and he's currently working for uh, the University of Texas at Arlington. Uh, Dr. Nicola Hay works for Caltech at JPL uh, Laboratory and he's one of my most recent graduate students as well. Uh, Dr. Eric Lindstedt of uh, Stanford University, Boeing, and currently is the director of uh, the Machine Learning Laboratory at Chapman University. Professor Thomas Piotta is a hydrologist and world renowned uh, climatologist uh, and an engineer. Professor Strupa, who is the president of Chapman University and very well renowned mathematician, and His Excellency Dr. Ablati, uh, the Minister of Water Resources um, in Egypt, uh, using his hat as a scientist, where we were exchanging some uh, very important thoughts uh, in the process of the research that we were conducting. Over the course of years, um, the Davis Forum have been highlighting what do we mean by the primary global risk, uh, which has been like, you know, reported in these reports uh, since like, you know, the, the past few years. And, and every single year, you would see those kind of representations, like those kind of, uh, of diamonds or circles, and having different colors, which are representing different kind of, uh, um, uh, of fields, like being uh, environmental, being societal, being technological, and so on and so forth. And you would see the two axes, the vertical axis represents the impact what are the most important global risks which are going to be facing humanity and what would be their impact, as well as we are going to see the likelihood on the horizontal axis and the likelihood which is showing you the possibility of their occurrence. Like, you know, are they going to occur or not? And you can see on the top quadrant, the first quadrant on the, on the top right here, uh, you would see like, you know, there are a lot of green diamonds and all of these represent uh, issues which are related to the global climate. So basically, we are observing an increase in the trend of the climatic or environmental risks which are facing humanity. But very interestingly, you will see like an also a red diamond in the first quadrant, which is water crisis, which is uh, recognized as a societal issue, not only an environmental one. And, and this is why like, you know, it's quite important for us to address these kind of risks in the future, specifically for a country like Egypt, which is uh, located in a hyper-arid region and basically depending on like 97% of its water resources coming from the River Nile. So it makes a lot of sense when we are observing a massive construction along the River Nile that we would like to, to observe uh, what's happening to that structure. We'd like to make sure um, um, to understand the safety of such structure, especially in the absence of some uh, uh, reports or some information. Uh, so we try our best. Along those lines, what would be the impact of GERD if we are talking about in the context of global risks? And you can see like, you know, this kind of mesh diagram, which is showing you the complexity of different kinds of drivers as well as risks. And you will see like the interconnectivity if we talk about, for instance, like climate change action uh, failure, like, you know, and add this to it, like, you know, lack of water resources, this is going to be a massive impact. If we talk about biodiversity loss, prolonged stagnation, human environmental damage, all of these are different kinds of risks which, which can, can be, like, you know, impacted or can be uh, multiplied, um, like in the presence or in the case of having another uh, issue or problem with, um, with the dirt. Um, the technology that I'm going to be showing today has been used and implemented on different kinds of constructions or different kinds of structures. As you can see, this is one of them, uh, one of the dams that collapsed already in Brazil. And the, the displacement or like the motion of such a structure has been recorded using uh, the DNSR technology or using the, the radar technology that we're going to be talking about today. And you can see the impact of such uh, a structure and like, you know, uh, what kind of a disastrous event it can be. And by the way, this is like such a small one compared to the one uh, in hand. Another example here uh, at the Lake Dunlop, you can see also um, the water spill here, and you can see the middle, uh, the middle parts of the dam. Um, and also you can see, you can observe the failure. This dam also has been recorded by um, some of the radar technology and showed like, you know, some kind of displacements as well. Uh, that's why it was kind of alarming for us to be, just to, to be aware, like, you know, we are, we are researchers, we are trying to understand uh, the safety of structures which are existing. Uh, we have no interest except in understanding the science behind it. This is the location of the, of, the, of the area of interest that we are interested in. And like, you know, for most of the people who might not be aware that when we are talking about the GERD project, it's not only made of one dam. However, we are talking here about two uh, structures. One of them is the, is the concrete one on the top right-hand side, which we call the GERD main dam. And the other one is the GERD saddle dam, which is the Rockfield dam. 
And these two structures together uh, allow us to have, like, you know, the claim, the capacity of water, which is to be, oops, which is to be, like, you know, 75 uh, um, billion cubic meter of water. Uh, but currently, like, you know, if we say, like, you know, if this structure doesn't exist, uh, the capacity of the, the water behind the main dam will not exceed 18.5 um, uh, cubic meter, billion um, uh, cubic meter. Uh, by looking into some satellite images over the course of years, we have been observing like the filling of, of that lake behind the main structure, which is like you know the concrete one, and you can see like that the water did not reach yet the the, the saddle dam, and this was taken in June 3rd, 2021, and this is one of the most recent images, which was taken October 26, which is basically. Uh, like yesterday or a couple of days ago, uh, 26, 2021, and the elevation of the water here is 580 meters, and you can see that the water is getting really close to the to the to the sided dam. But also, interestingly enough, you can see some of these colors which are present in the water, which is also a representation of some kind of contamination which might be present in the water because of the. Uh, vegetation cover, like you know, this area is highly vegetated. You have a lot of trees, you have a lot of, uh, like you know, vegetation cover, and this kind of water contamination um, is is shown here. And this satellite images is what we call optical. Like so, we are talking about uh, a visible and infrared range of the spectrum. So what you guys are seeing right now is what we call reflectance. So basically, like the sunlight is going to the structure, or sorry, to the to the object that we are studying, and comes back to you, and that's why you are observing it in this way. The reason I'm saying that because the, the other technology that we are going to be introducing is, is different. So what you see here is something that we call optical, and this is basically passive technology. What do I mean by passive? It depends on the sunlight. So basically, the sun is your source of energy. What we are going to be talking about in the, in the, like, you know, in the coming few slides, we are not depending on the sun. We are depending on our source of illumination. So we are sending the beam ourselves. We are sending something different, different from uh, the sunlight. So basically, like you know, the technology that we are talking today uh, about is called synthetic aperture radar. Uh, by the word synthetic, we are uh, we are saying that uh, it is being synthesized. So basically, we are creating the antenna ourselves in a mathematical way. So the bigger the antenna, you have more signals, so you are able to have more information about the structure that you are trying. A ton of applications that we can talk about when, when it comes to SAR or the synthetic aperture radar, which is also different from the optical, as I mentioned, like, you know, this is the visible. Uh, but, but you can also see in this one, uh, in this animation, which is going to come back, like, you know, how the SAR technology is working. Uh, so basically, like, you are sending the beam from that sen sensor to a specific location, and the beam bounces back towards the satellite. And when you are recording this beam, based on the way you are recording it, and over the course of time, as you can see, the satellite is going, uh, like, you know, around the globe, and you have coverage at different locations. So basically, when you are observing these kind of swathes or these areas, you are collecting beams, and when these beams come back to you, it gives you different informations. If I'm looking at the same exact spot, if I'm looking at a specific point on the ground, I can get information about elevations. I can see if that point is moving up or down, like, you know, it's subsiding or not. Like, you know, if you can, you can see the vertical deformation. If the beam is going on the ground, basically, we can create what we call the topography or the DEM or the digital elevation model. So basically, very quickly here, like, you know, assuming that this is a structure, this is the ground surface at line one that we are aware of. You have the satellite is sending a beam, which is like in this dark color, and you don't know what is under the ground. You have no idea if the ground is moving or not, but for some reason, the ground moved a little bit, the satellite came back, sent another beam, and the beam difference here is what we call phase change, or like the phase difference, is what we use in order to understand this kind of vertical motion, be it an uplift or be it a subsidence. So like this kind of vertical motion can be in both ways. So you can see here the technique just showing you uh, the first pass. Maybe it's not moving again. Anyway, so like that's the idea behind the technique. So basically, like you have the first pass here, and there is a little bit of motion in the ground that you don't know, you cannot see, you are not aware of. But the beam can penetrate because it is a kind of a long wave beam, like you know, it's in the microwave region of the spectrum. So it's something different, which does have 
a huge capability of penetrating the ground. So, so the idea here is that it can penetrate and that phase difference between the surface and the new surface will give you this different kind of displacement. How do we know? We get these two kinds of satellite images, as you can see, November 13, November 18, they look exactly the same. But we create something different from them, which we call an interferogram. That's why our technology is called INSAR, and the I refers to the interferometric SAR or synthetic aperture radar. And when you see this interferogram, you can see the boundary line, like you can see the difference in those colors. That kind of, of edge is the representation of that structure, and then you can see the motion happening in the vertical uh, direction. Speaking about Africa, representing here the rift arc system, which is quite, uh, quite uh, interesting. You can see the number of folds, like cracks, and also the number of the active volcanoes on the East African rift, all of this area extending from the Red Sea, going into Ethiopia and going into uh, that part of Africa. And now the INSAR is going like, you know, around those locations. So now you can see different kind of passes. That's what we are talking about. The satellites are going, but we are more interested in having satellite images on the same exact spot. So now I'm looking into a specific location. And a few days later, I have another satellite image at the same exact location. A few days later, I have another satellite image on the same exact location, and I make sure that they are geolocated. So we do something which is called coherence in order to uh, check the quality of the images. Then we create that interferogram. Like, you know, these colorful images represent for you the change in the altitude. And when you look at those rings, you can see now we have an uplift, three centimeters, six centimeters, nine centimeters. You can, so you can measure that vertical displacement, not only an uplift, but you can also see the next structure, which will show you a kind of uh, a subsidence. So basically, the technology with very high accuracy can show you a change in the vertical displacement, be it an uplift or be it a subsidence. Let's apply this on our case study. We took different cross sections across the GERD structure. This is the concrete structure. Uh, we took those cross sections in order to observe, in order to allow the INSAR to be revolving at every single cross section. We get a lot of images. We have been working with more than 100 plus images. We took some of the images out of the analysis because they were giving us some kind of an outlier, like some not interesting results, so we, we excluded them. And we, we just looked at those different locations of, uh, of the dam. Let me compare now between cross sections one and six. I want you to just pay attention to number one and number six. When we are looking at these two uh, areas, the east abutment and the west abutment, we are looking into two curves here. The dark curve represents the west part, the blue curve represents the east part. If you take a look on the vertical axis, you only see negative values. So basically, it's showing you a decline, or it's showing you what we call a subsidence. So basically, there is a vertical displacement in the negative side. And you see that both curves are walking hand in hand. Both of them are just like, you know, moving together. So in other words, the subsidence is kind of uniform at a specific point, at some point. Then we keep looking into the time series, and at some points you can see a little bit of displacement between the two curves. And when the two curves are not overlaid on each other, it's telling you that you are lacking a little bit of uniformity. So there is a displacement, but not even that, but the displacement is not that uniform. That's why you can see at the time of the first filling, we see like, you know, a massive jump between the both curves, like the two curves are getting far apart from each other, which is telling you that there is a little bit of non-uniformity in these structures. And then going uh, like, you know, to the second filling, we have some interesting results that we are going to be sharing in, a, in another scientific publication before showing it here. Same thing for the other cross-sections, same thing for the other cross-sections. We also did a spatial representation. So not only we want to look into a time series, like, but we want to see the distribution on the ground. We want to see what are the locations which are showing different kinds of displacement. And you can see on the structure itself, on the body of the dam itself, you would see here very interesting areas. Like we can see these colorful pixels or these colorful circles are representing different values of subsidence. So basically, you are observing a change in the subsidence at totally different rate at different areas of, uh, of that structure, which is interesting and it's worth looking at. So if we have some 
ground observations, if we have some data, that, that would be great. Like, you know, we would love to see some data which can show that these results are not that accurate. We wanted to make sure, we wanted to validate the results. Like, you know, when I'm looking into these two different cross sections and I'm having different displacements at different points, we said, let's, let's uh, look into the water edge. So basically, like, you know, if you have the structure this way, the water is attached to the structure. So you are looking into the edge of the water at that structure, at the intersection point. If the structure is moving non-uniformly, it's going to create different kind of waves. That's why you are going to observe that the water itself might be propagating in different ways. And this is basically what we observe. So basically, if you take a look in section number one, section number six, like the east abutment, the west abutment, you are going to see that the water behavior at the edge of the structure is behaving in a different way. It is not uniform, which is another validation to the fact that we are having a non-uniformity in the displacement of the structure. If you take a look at section number four, it's quite interesting because section number four represents the gate that everybody remembers. Like section number four is taken at that gate where it was opened to let the water flow towards Sudan and Egypt. So basically, like, you know, when this gate was opened, you would see that kind of drop in the water edge. Before it dropped, like, you know, it was closed, so you can see a kind of a like, um, harmonious kind of representation of the water, but when at the moment it was opened, uh, it dropped. It dropped and you can see uh, how it behaves. We are doing that over the course of time. So basically, like you have different kind of images which are taken across the time. This analysis started from 2016 all the way until 2021. So basically, over the, the course of time, you can see, for instance, how INSAR is behaving. So over the course of years, and we are doing our interferograms. So now I'm showing you a time series of the uplifting and the, and the subsidence. So basically, the INSAR technology can show you that as a function of time. And this is exactly what we did. So basically, we did the, the whole general trend over the Jir Dam, the accumulative or the cumulative displacements over the Jir Dam at different cross sections over the course of time. What is most important or uh, interesting feature that you can see here? The change in the colors. Look at the east part and the west part. On the west part, it's more reddish colors. On the east part, it's more bluish, greenish colors. Bluish, greenish is a totally different range of displacement as compared to the, to the red one. So in other words, you don't have a uniformity in the displacement. And we are not structural engineers. I am not an engineer. I have no clue about the structure itself. It's not my business. I'm just an Earth system scientist who is observing based on satellite data. So I cannot claim, like, you know, from a structural point of view, this is good or bad. Engineers can talk about that. The course of time, we have uh, annual changes, we are uh, monitoring, we are uh, observing, and we are doing the same exact thing for the Sadat Dam, which is also a totally different uh, uh, ball game here because of the interesting structures around it. Remember, I showed you the rift arc system, and you have a lot of faults and cracks in that whole region, which is okay. We did the same thing, like we look at the, 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 the cross sections and we observe a displacement and the displacement is, is also not uniform. But interestingly enough, there isn't a single drop of water at the Sadat Dam yet. So basically, like there is no horizontal pressure which is pushing towards the structure or even the soil itself. So it is, it is quite a legit question to ask what might be the reasons causing that kind of pressure and maybe causing a little bit of non-uniformity in that kind of displacement. It's just a scientific question that we are addressing. Same thing, we collected all the different kinds of displacement and showing you the cross-section or the, the, the representation of the displacement across the entire structure. Um, and interestingly enough, also in the absence of water, you can see some of these patches, like you know the red ones, the, the orange ones. And interestingly enough, when we looked at those patches, we figured out that those patches are actually matching some of the very weak zones or weak areas which are present underneath the structure itself. So when we looked into the geology of the area, when we looked into like, you know, what, what different kind of rock formations are present there in terms of chemical composition, in terms of physical properties, or in terms of the different kind of, of, of faulting systems, uh, like, you know, it was very interesting to look at that. This is what we call the plate tectonics. So for those who are uh, aware, like, you know, all these blue lines are lines which are tectonically active. So basically, like, you know, when we observe an earthquake or when we observe a volcanic eruption, they happen along those lines. 
and you can see that very interesting line here, which is the arc system, and it goes like you know into into that part of East Africa. Representation of active earthquakes present um, in Africa and also in Ethiopia. You can see all these circles represent like you know past earthquakes already that happened in that location, and this is the structure map of the area. Where the, where the saddle dam is present. So basically, that yellow box that we are highlighting and then we are maximizing the image in number B is basically the location of the saddle dam. So all these red lines and all these blue lines represent actual fractures and cracks which are already present in the ground. We looked into the cross sections, we looked into the geology, you can see the different colors represent different geological formations with different properties. So basically, like the formations are having, some of them are chests, like, you know, which is a very weak, different kind of rock. And, and this is uh, actual information on the ground. And by looking into those points that I'm highlighting, like those circuits, basically those circuits are matching those weak points or weak lines, and we call them nodes here. Uh, you can see the overlay, same, same image, but like, you know, with a different background. And same thing here, I'm showing you the time series, the representation of, uh, of uh, that uh, like displacement that we observed over the over the Jared uh, saddle dam. So basically, our analysis showed an alarming differential displacement at different sections of the Jared's main dam and the saddle dam using Sentinel-1. For anybody who is aware, like or would like to check some of these outputs, the data is available for free. We also intentionally used free source data because it's available. Everybody can look into it, and the technology that we applied is called DNSAR that you can also uh, look into. Uh, there is a wide gap, and this uh, needs to be uh, addressed. And maybe we feel like, you know, that when you are filling with high amounts of water in a very rapid pace, that also might, uh, like, you know, uh, exacerbate this different kind of displacement. There is an uneven vertical displacement, as we mentioned. So this study basically raises a question regarding the geoid stability and consequently its structure safety. Uh, and um, the dark consequences in the case of a failure. Like, you know, it, I think it is very appropriate for us like, just to think, what if, just a, a what if scenario, uh, it is a legitimate question uh, that we need to address scientifically, and this is exactly what we are doing. The study presents an early warning uh, on massive risk, which requires like, you know, more appropriate investigations to be conducted and to have this kind of complementarity relationship to make sure uh, that we have uh, ways of observing and monitoring. Thank you so much for your, for, uh, your interest and uh, we'll have to take questions.